Don't open the slip, though. Square the frames. It's Lewis here on the line for the sessions. I was. Well, it's all about it. It's actually a sustained number. No. Sustained number. It's automatic. With my circular saw rotating. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, well, we'll try it out over We'll try it out over there, yeah. Uh, I'll start getting a screechy sound, that's probably okay, but that's me. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Yes, uh, catch on to the road, and then uh, once you got to the road, you're okay, right? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Don't wait for the rest Hey, it works for me. Sorry. I got away by it. Okay, okay. Uh, testing one, two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. The quick brown starship jumped over the super giant. Thank you. Also, it's accessible. Okay. This is up in the Okay. Hello. Everything okay over there? You can actually hear me, I hope? Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, good. So now I'm wired. Oh, okay. Well, no one tells me anything. Are you? Yeah. God. Okay. As long as we're good. Okay. All right. Okay, just uh, when it's green. Yeah. You're good to go. Okay. Well, she's green, all right. Okay. All right. So as long as uh, that's as long as you're okay, and I'm not deafening you over there, we're good. Okay. I I just wanted to kind of get a benchmark of where you're. Oh yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. That's good because I've been trying to get a benchmark for five years. Can't get a darn thing. <laughs> so good. All right. Can you hear me now? Good. 
I mean, they're all for for distance. I mean, they're they're only six and a half. Close to Suzanne. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, we'll What's going on in here, if anything? Looks like. Oh, you're looking over the equipment. Mike is getting ready for the next youth group meeting. Yeah. He's okay. Gonna be, he's going to be um, sharing it or. Yeah, or sounds sounds like fun. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, heaven only knows there's a ton of stuff in here. I don't know what's for, but. Well, it's all it's for this one. So you just put this in the, yeah. Uh, hmm. Oh, cool. Oh. You know, if, I wish I wish I had realized that you were going to be up here and you were doing the preparation over here. There's a book called Exploring the Sky. It came out some quite some years ago. It's still great. Um, it's I have the larger format. It's got the smaller one, which sucks in plain English, because uh, you can't read anything. You can't hardly see the diagrams. Yeah. But there's all sorts of activities and experiments and such to set up a, like.
Good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Paul Cirillo. I'm a board member here at NJAA. I'd like to officially welcome you. Um, our bylaws require us to have an official meeting, a uh, public meeting, uh, a few several times a year. So this will be an official uh, meeting. It uh, won't be long. Uh, but I now call the uh, New Jersey Astronomical Association uh, meeting to order. And I have to report to you that our current uh, treasury balance is at $49,687. Uh, as of last month, uh, we had uh, one new member, uh, Stephen Hand. Stephen, are you here? No? Okay. Uh, and Stephen was... Uh, was uh, was accepted by our, our regular board meeting, which met today at uh, four o'clock. And uh, with that, uh, I open it up. Are there any questions uh, from the floor? All right. I'd now like to uh, uh, ask uh, Diane Garlick, our um, uh, nominations. Thank you. With blank on that, our nominations committee uh, chair to uh, make the nominations for the board for the next year. Good to see y'all here tonight. Um, we have some good news, kind of, and, well, definitely good news and a little sad news. Um, Mr. Roselli is going to continue as the president of NJAA. Al Witzkill is going to continue as vice president. Bob Starcher is going to continue as the observatory director. Paul Sorello, of course, is going to continue as recording secretary. Barb Dubois is going to con continue is corresponding secretary. Mike Milan, however, is going to um, hand over the treasurer position to somebody else for the next year. Uh, right now, I need to take any nominations from the floor. No nominations? Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Diane. And, uh, 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 let's see, I think I'll close the meeting first. So may I have a uh, motion to close our meeting? So close. Thank you. Okay. I hereby declare our uh, general meeting over. See, that wasn't too bad, was it? No. And now I'd like to, again, welcome you, and I'll turn you over now to our program chair, uh, Mr. John Anders. You know, that was lame. I expected <sighs> someone to raise their hand and say Donald's off. <laughs> but no. No, I'm like, man. John. Oh, I'm sorry. I stayed in the line. Not there. Perfect. Good, good, good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Well, okay. Let's talk about the speaker tonight. And it's our own Alan Witzkow. He has a degree in, uh, in earth science. He's very, very active here with NJAA and extremely active with the AAI, the Amateur Astronomers uh, Incorporated in Cranford. He, uh, he works for, well, he's a senior optician for ESCO Optics, which recently had a I had fire, but now he's right at the moment. What are you doing now, Alan? You're actually putting a building together. Well, and, uh, okay. We're trying to uh, get all the optics that were damaged by soot cleaned and rebagged. We're still going to be able to do uh, production work maybe next week, I hope. Yes. Uh, we're getting there. He's getting there, so that you may have seen it in the, in the newspaper. Um, he, he also has a history of building telescopes. He was in high school and also in college. And in 1977, one of those scopes, it was a 10-inch uh, reflector, took first award in stellar thing. You have to be real special to have first award in stellar thing. Um, it's the birthplace of amateur uh, telescope making. So tonight, lunar geology, a history of the moon, but he also told me, and why we need to go back. It's not there. <laughs> Welcome, Alan. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry we're having standard uh, New Jersey observing weather out there, so I guess I have something related to a captive audience tonight. Uh, but the subject over here uh, is very important, really. Uh, if we want to understand where our Earth came from, how we, the planet has come up to where it is now, we have to look at our nearest neighbor, which was formed shortly after the Earth was, of course, the Moon. Uh, the gentleman who has uh, his back impolitely to you over here, by the way, is Buzz Aldrin. This is off Apollo 11, where he was uh, moving scientific equipment uh, to, into position for the very first time for a human being to be on the surface of another world and be able to analyze and send that information back to the Earth. 
Um, the history of the moon part is basically how we know what we know today and how it has affected Earth in some uh, many ways. So let's uh, move along over here. There we go. So for centuries, we've been enthralled by this nearest neighbor, the moon. And this is a classic uh, photograph of it as it's rising. But what exactly are we seeing over here? Any geologist will tell you that when you look at a planetary surface, if you have a rocky world like Earth or Mars or uh, the moon in this case, it's very much like a book. But you have to learn how to read it to understand the story. Uh, the moon itself, by the way, because the surface, and everyone is familiar with lunar craters and such, has been pounded for about four billion years or so, knows that that, that book, that library up there, has all its pages ripped out and thrown all over the place. And our job is to try to make some kind of coherent sense out of it. That way we would understand the story. I'm just going to go rather quickly through a, a history of early lunar studies. Around the same time that Galileo was doing his work in 1608, this gentleman here, an Englishman, Thomas Harriot, drew maps of the moon with a six-power refractor. In other words, he basically took an eyeglass lens and a smaller one behind it, just like Galileo did. But he looked at the moon and drew what he saw, and it's pretty close to how you would see it through a low power and maybe a dude over, <laughs> uh, hazed over uh, optic. Six power is less than most finders on telescopes as sold out of department stores. But he did quite a bit of beautiful work on this, the relative placements of things, of the mare, the seas, if you will, on the moon, just about right. And he had noted a number of craters here, which he had, had given numbers to. Okay. And of course, as I mentioned, he was a contemporary of this gentleman here. Of course, this is Galileo. Uh, his two telescopes, the only one that's actually operational, by the way, he had four of them. Fully operational is this one over here, number four. Number three has his objective lens, does not have the eyepiece. And uh, it's a shame because one of them, the second one he had, called, he called it the old discoverer. It was the instrument that he used to discover the moons of Jupiter, uh, the phases of the planet Venus, and almost but not quite seeing the rings of Saturn. All we have of it is the objective lens, and it has a crack through it. It's really a shame that. However, his drawings through that instrument, confused us for many years until finally someone decided to build modern day replicas of, with lenses about the same quality, if not a little better. And it turns out that what he was actually seeing was from through a very narrow field of view. The moon was this big, he was only looking at a section like this. So when we saw what looked like a quarter moon, he was only looking at a tiny part of it. Hevelius uh, believe it or not, this is a telescope uh, in Gdansk in Poland. This instrument had a four inch aperture and a focal length of roughly 100 feet. That was to get around optical defects and particularly what they call color or chromatic aberration. Uh, he used his refractors though to map the moon and chart the effects of what we call libration. We do not see exactly 50 percent of the moon. We see about 59 percent because sometimes the moon moves a little bit further off in its orbit relative to the Earth, so we see a little bit past what we would pass to the horizon so to where we, what we used to call the lunar far side. And you can see he had it right. Very, very nicely done here. Now this was posted, by the way, was uh, published uh, uh, posthumously by his wife, his second wife Elizabeth, who was an astronomer in her own right back in the early 17th century. Vericchioli began the tradition of naming features on the moon's surface. And he, you can just about make out, even up here, a number of the Mare Nubium Sea of Clouds, Mare Chrysium Sea of Crises, or Destroyed, Mare Tranquillitatis, of course, Tranquility, Sea of Tranquility, Serenitatis, Sea of Serenity. He had a great imagination for a lot of these, uh, these features. Many of the craters over here, he decided to honor a number of noblemen that had, at the time, that had been, uh, he was looking for favor for. But it's the first time that he decided that to, he was going to do this. Interesting, too, uh, areas on the far side of the libration of effect, because he even says it up here, the nomenclature of the lunar libration. And he even says one area over here, apparently he didn't see anything, so he called it terra steratatis, in other words, sterilized earth. Okay. okay. But it was Tobias Meyer in the 18th century 
who was the first astronomer to use a precise micrometric positions. He was able to put a crosshair, in effect, onto the moon and be able to break it up into various sections here in, in uh, longitude and latitude, or today we call it actually co-longitude, a latitude here matched to here on Earth. And this is not a bad map at all. It looks very, very similar to what we have today. Many of the features are easily seen. Okay. In the 19th century, James Naismith and James Carpenter wrote a book called The Moon, considered as a planet, a world, and a satellite. That was 1874. These are not photographs of the moon. These are actually plaster models made from drawings that James Nasmith made at the eyepiece of the telescope. Matter of fact, you see the telescope up to the top here. It's a 20 inch. This still exists. You go to the London Science Museum and you can actually see where he would sit and move this like, effectively like a cannon up down 360 degrees around. When he made these models, they're very, very close to how you would actually see the moon through a telescope, except he got one thing wrong, of course, here. The mountains of the moon do not look jagged like that. That illusion continued into the early space age. In reality, because there's no atmosphere, a slight bump seems to leave a very stark and long shadow. But he got it right. I mean, here's Archimedes, uh, yeah, Archimedes Crater, and Autolycus, Arzatial over here, the Apennine Mountains. He got everything positionally right. He just kind of blew it when it came to <laughs> Uh, to the actual heights of the mountains of the moon. Oh, by the way, um, you, may, you all here probably know James Nesmith indirectly. How many people have been awakened by the beautiful sound of a jackhammer early in the morning? Number of people, a couple people, you can, you can admit it. Okay, we all heard it at one time or another. Uh, he was the engineer that invented that in the, eight, in the 19th century. So uh, every time you hear it, try to think a little fondly as you're being waking out of a sound sleep. Uh, that allowed him at the age of 43, he lived to be 84. At 43 he was able to, to retire because of that piece of mechanical engineering to the most sublime of sciences, that of astronomy. So I guess there's some mixed blessings there. Okay. But by the 19th century most astronomers at that time believed that the craters of the moon and even on Earth, with few they recognized, were volcanic in origin. Nazareth believed that this was the mechanism. Basically you had materials coming up from within the interior of the moon. They would fountain to either side creating a crater and of course as it kind of petered out it would leave a center peak. Not a single example of this effect could be found on Earth uh, until about 10 years ago. What happened was uh, Bonnie, my wife and I were driving uh, on Route 22 and there was a, it was cold, it was, I think it was in what, in January, February? And there was this fountain that somebody forgot to turn off uh, in front of an insurance company, one of these little small buildings, and it had this effect. So maybe they saw a fountain that was half frozen. I don't know. But it was the only way, I could, only explanation I would have for this. Even today, you will not see any kind of volcanism at all like this here on Earth. Okay, but this gentleman over here, this is Ralph Baldwin. He just passed away just recently. He was uh, 94, if I remember correctly. He uh, studied astronomy. Uh, went into industry, but kept his hand in the study of his favorite subject, which of course was the moon. This book is a rarity, The Face of the Moon, but he got it right. He correctly deduced that most craters and many of the features on the moon are from impacts. Little stuff as tiny as a grain of sand all the way up to stuff, well, <laughs> about the size of Manhattan and bigger, over its four and a half billion year history. Okay, and this gentleman over here, a special uh, guy, the founder of astrogeology. This is Gene Shoemaker. He determined the origin of meteor crater. Uh, he was studying actually, in, not impacts, but explosions, atomic explosions that were detonated underground by a company called Sandia. And he looked at the moon and he looked at the blast effects and he said, you know, if you had something coming in at a high velocity, cosmic velocity as we call it, about 20, 30, 40,000 miles an hour, crashes into a solid surface. It's going to blow stuff out just like a nuke would do. And he scoured the Earth for ancient impact sites. And his astronomer wife, Carolyn, I had the privilege of meeting her some years ago, and others, he created a new field, astrogeology, which is the study of geologic processes on other worlds and referenced here to Earth. Uh, yes, he was with the early Apollo program, which is why we see him with an early model, of course, here, of the lunar lander. And uh, I, again, uh, he, he 
unfortunately he passed away, but I guess he it was, if you got to go, this is the way to do it, doing what you love doing. He was out in the Australian outback. He was looking uh, near Tenham Creek, which is a site of an ancient impact, what's called an astrobleen, star wound. Um, unfortunately, when they rounded the corner, somebody was in his lane. It was a head-on collision. <coughs> Carol was lucky she survived. He did not. But it's really a shame because uh, his work, his work really pioneered everything we've done so far since about 1960 or so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about geological definitions. A crater, of course, is a bowl-shaped cavity in a planetary surface, and it's, in this case, it's created by meteoritic impact. A caldera, a little different, is a bowl-shaped cavity, but it's created by volcanism, and once the lava is out, you have a collapse of the materials over it. A fault line, of course, is a region of stress on a planetary surface, not just here on Earth, released by crustal movement. A rill is a meandering channel on a planet's surface and from which drainage of magma and or collapse of a lava tube. You go to Hawaii, you see full-scale lava tubes there. And you see where some of them have collapsed. And a catena, no, not the uh, gentleman who sells cars, uh, a line of craters formed by multiple impacts. Catena is Latin for chain. And last, a mare, an expansive flood basalt that fills an impact basin. So when you make a crater, this is essentially what happens. The object comes in, crashes here and actually detonates right about here. That blast throws material out. Most of the time you have a central uplift. Material comes from the center up. It collapses back down. In the final form, sometimes we get some inadvertent melting and that flows up and partially fills the crater. This is the basic principle of cratering. It's established now that crater impacts have shaped the vast majority of the features that we see on the moon. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go. A rebound effect, that's right. At these speeds, <coughs> these temperatures and energies, solid rock operates and sometimes becomes molten, very plastic, and it come up and back down. Usually not all the way back now. Uh, when you make a Mara Basin, the face of the moon, as they say, uh, it's similar to craters, but a much grander scale. A crater, say, uh, uh, I'll mention a number of them, we'll have photos of them later, uh, like Copernicus which is easy to see about nine or ten days after new moon, uh, even a pair of binoculars will show it, in you know, an area called Mara Imbrium. That was formed by an object about twice the size of Manhattan about 900 million years ago. It's pretty big. If you brought it here to Earth, it would stretch from New York to Trenton in one shot. So it's a big object, but it's actually reasonably small compared to making a Mara. It's a good-sized object comes in, could be on the order of about 10 miles across, maybe more, maybe less. Makes a large impact, sometimes multiple impacts, as you see here. Molten material from within the lunar, uh, the lunar magma comes up and fills it. And by the way, when we're talking about basalt magma, it isn't like you would see in Hawaii, or if we have an eruption out there again in Iceland, where it's relatively viscous and it takes a long time for it to flow. In this case, the flood basalts, we're talking here true flood basalts, they would move about at the same speed that very warm motor oil would traverse your garage floor or what have you. Uh, they would cool here on Earth, maybe a degree a day, a couple degrees a day tops. On the moon, it's about a degree every 20 minutes. So the stuff comes out and then freezes. So you get multiple thin layers as this material would pump out. And finally, get to the bottom here, we have the appearance of the moon today. Faulting. On Earth, it's caused by stresses, like you see over here on the right, sli uh, strike slip. They come together and move, or normally just fall down or come up in a thrust form. Here on the moon, instead of being tectonic forces, what well, we would have plate tectonics or continental drift. This is because there's heating directly below it and maybe a Mara lava cooling. And you can see where it just cut right across. It's quite, a, quite an impressive thing to see uh, faults on the moon. They're not that many easily visible, but some of the big ones like this, yeah, you can see them. What's, what's the scale on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back one. The crater over here is not quite 20 miles across. So you can see that's quite a long fault going through here. If I remember correctly, this particular one, I don't remember the exact name because they all have names. I believe this thing was on the order of about 200 miles long. <coughs> okay. 
Now there are four basic mineral types, rocks and minerals rather, that make up the lunar surface today. First one is this. This is anorthosite. It's calcium rich for the most part, comprising the original crust of the moon. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Ilmenite, which uh, is an iron titanium oxide. If you're looking for ore minerals and such, uh, the moon is practically screaming to us that there's free titanium all over the place, not to mention iron as well. On Earth, we can find it. We have some pretty good high-grade ores here and there. But it's nice to have it in the form of an oxide such as this because you have sun t sunlight for 14 days and almost any given point on the moon. You can concentrate it, not have to worry about clouds like we have today. You don't have to worry about anything like that. You're going to concentrate the heat of the sun with large mirrors. You can almost borderline to vaporize the rock, force the oxygen out. Of course, you want to collect it because you want to breathe it, use it for rocket fuel. And then separating out the titanium and the iron is rather just a matter of chemistry. And uh, I would love to have, be able to mine the moon for titanium. Under the right conditions, you could, if you could replace all the iron that's in your car right now, it would be only two-thirds its weight because that's how heavy steel is, and even aluminum doesn't help much. There's not that much of it in there, even today. It would never rust, which is the best part of it. And also, the frame would be stronger than the steel you're replacing. The best of all worlds. And then pyroxene, which is an iron magnesium silicate. There are at least minimal, about 400 varieties of this type of rock. But it's found mostly in the Mara basalt lavas. And then finally, olivine. Uh, many people would know this by its gem quality name, uh, peridot. It's an iron magnesium silicate. And there are other minerals that exist there, but they're in microscopic amounts as far as we can tell. And this is usually because of cosmic rays and meteor micrometeorite interaction. The little thing comes in there, hits it as a point of energy, it reacts, and then freezes in that position. So composition is there. There may be many, many other minerals, but so far this is the predominant stuff we have found. So if you plot a color atlas of the moon and you enhance where other materials such as iron and titanium would be, the titanium is in blue, the iron is in kind of a rusty orange red. You can see there's quite a bit of iron and titanium here and you notice where the large craters are like Copernicus over here I mentioned before and Kepler and even Aris especially Aristarchus over here. This is We're going to be talking about this particular crater later. But you notice that the material that's thrown out is mostly what they call anorthosite, that feldspar we were talking about before. And the lunar highlands are loaded with it. Tycho Crater here is the brightest, one, the second brightest actually crater on the moon. It's rather young, about two, 225 million years old. But look at that ray structure. Whatever was underneath it got blown up and out. That's a small crater, it's only about 30 miles across. Okay, but nothing beats, you can send cameras there, you can look at it remotely from Earth, but nothing beats going to ground truth. It's a geologic term, basically it's called boots on the ground, or in this case, uh, moon boots. And this is uh, Apollo 16 and Apollo 17. Apollo 17, this gentleman over here is Jack Schmidt. He is the only trained geologist that so far has gone to, to work on the surface of the moon back in Apollo 17 in December, I believe, of 1972. Um, gentleman over here uh, from 16 is uh, John Young and he's using a special piece of equipment to sieve out rocks without having to bend over. They found out that these moon suits protected them reasonably well from the horrible environment. The superheat on the sun is 200, about 250 degrees. In shadow it drops down to about 200 below. There's no oxygen there. Everything that could go wrong could, did not happen. They got lucky with this. Except for one tiny problem. This is all pressurized. Even at three and a half pounds per square inch of pure oxygen, trying to bend down was an effort at the very least. Many times they fell down. They were able to do a push up and get back up on their feet. Rather dangerous thing to do when you have a helmet that between your nose and the vacuum of space is only about that far. You don't want to hit that. So they had to make tools in the later flights that allowed them to stay in a pretty much a standing position to be able to sieve through the lunar surface. And by the way, this is not soil. This is regolith. Rock crushed up from all these billions upon billions of impacts, little and small. There's no life here. We know that now. 
We were wondering if maybe something might survive it. It's a hard vacuum, the temperature extremes, all the impacts and such and melting. There are no organics here. The only organics that we, that we found there were what we had, re, had brought there and returned. Now a robot would just pass this by. This is Apollo 17 and they were pressed for time. They had to go to the next station. And then they found this. This is orange soil. It was kicked up by human boots. And uh, the conversation goes that uh, Schmidt looks down and he says, hey, it's orange soil. And he says, let me pick up my visor. The visor was gold coated to keep the infrared out, but it also could distort the color a little bit. So he pulls it up. It's still orange. And it turns out that this was very exciting because they wondered if maybe this stuff was very, very recently thrown out of a volcano. Not billions of years ago, maybe as little as a million, which in geologic terms is you know, just blink your eyes and you miss it. So they put a gnomon, as it's called over here, a shadow stick with a bunch of color swatches, and there it all is. And a robot would probably not even have seen this. And they would miss the story in the soil. Now it turns out that the color, we originally thought that maybe there had been some water, at least for a little while, and rusted out iron minerals and even metallic iron that was in the surface of the moon. It turned out that the color is actually from titanium, which is also an exciting discovery. So I just put a composite together that in theory, this is what happened. There was some uh, volcanism nearby, threw all this magma out, fine dust and materials and little tiny little droplets and flowed down here. And then about two billion years, three billion years later, humans kicked up the soil to be able to see what had the moon had given us from its interior. And just below the surface, the core samples, basically you just take, a, in effect, you take a pipe and you drive it in the ground and you pull it up and the sample it's in that tells you what's underground. Works. Core samples from Apollo and then seismic information. There were seismometers left up there that would pick up moon quakes. And it gave a subsurface structure that we believe this to be accurate. Down to about 10 meters, it's all regolith. It's fine grain that's been crushed up into a very, very fine, but very, very jagged material. One of the most dangerous things you could have on the moon, of course, is to have your suit worn away by something the equivalent of diamond sandpaper. And that's exactly what they were experiencing. You go down between, uh, down to as much as maybe around two kilometers lower, and there's large scale ejector, basically broken up material from all those impacts, the create, creation of craters and such. Below that, there is disturbed crust, material that's fractured, but it hasn't been physically moved away. There are fractures that go even further, maybe as much as 25 kilometers, about 18, not quite 18 miles. Below that, we think we will find an intact lunar crust. The furthest down that humans have, ever, have ventured, if you will, with equipment is only about two and a half meters, roughly about 10 feet. That's it. But from seismic, by studying moonquakes from several stations, this is what we believe you would find if you could dig down that far. Okay. But even the tiniest pinch of regolith tells you a lot. Here you have, uh, this corresponds to this guy over here. It's what we call a soil brachia. Basically, take the soil and crush it together hard enough for a moment so that it heats up for a second and then fuses together. The white material there the G piece, again, is anorthosite, part of the original lunar crust. And there are other things here, too. You have these little, there, these little beads here. This is one of the reasons, by the way, the moon seems so bright. There are titanium and other mineral uh, glasses up there. And because you have, have quadrillions upon quadrillions upon quadrillions of these things all over the place, they gather the light and shoot the light back to Earth. It's highly reflective. If you have white paint, titanium dioxide, which is what makes all the white over here this bright. Now you have it fused as a glass, and it reflects all the light here. And yet, if you were on the moon, you would say that's impossible because it can't be that bright because everything around you is as dark as charcoal. It's all because of the beads that are in that dark material. And there are other samples over here. There's a coarse basalt over here. The crystal structure tells you it took a long time, a relatively long time to cool. There's a lot in here. Uh, this came, um, this is by the way, is how you get on the cover of a magazine. Uh, that picture on that side there in color uh, made it to March 70, 19, uh, 1970 Sky and Telescope. 
and the scale on the bottom there is in millimeters or roughly about a 25th of an inch so you can see how tiny all these pieces are but each individual one is a separate specimen and volcanoes of course create lava tubes Hawaii is riddled with these things you can see you can practically as many of them you can practically drive a small car through and it looks like it's the same on the moon now when I first saw this photograph I said I gotta do this lecture because this is amazing this is the Sea of Tranquility. Apparently the many lava flows over time built up a lot of thin layers. Thin as little as perhaps a meter. Some of the big ones, the orange ones over here, are 13 meters, about the height of this building. And you're able to look through this. This is like a skylight. And it might make it easier to put lunar bases there. After all, you don't want to be in an area where during the day you have some kind of air conditioner keeping that 250 degree temperature away from you. And then at night you've got to turn the heat on. That consumes a lot of power. Also, you've got to worry about radiation from the sun and from cosmic radiation. Particles accelerated by supernovae, and when they hit you, it goes literally right through you. Many of the uh, astronauts, even today, aboard uh, the International Space Station, complain occasionally they see flashes of light. Those flashes of light are real because it's going right through the eye. And it some, it can be dangerous, let's face it. It's, uh, it's high energy particles, and similar radiation comes from the sun. But if you can go underground, and here you got a total thickness here, uh, something like about 35, uh, yeah, about 50 feet, that's enough to stop almost anything, at least within reason. And the thing I especially like was this. They're looking at boulders that fell down here, and what is in the shadows out here? It's that, you know, something hidden, like Kipling said. Something hidden, go find it. Maybe we have ready-made bases waiting for us. More caves. Or now, the Marius Hills area is already known for volcanic cone, uh, the cinder cones. There was a natural place to look, and it turns out we have sinuous rills that are collapsed lava tubes all through here. And there is a pit right here, big enough to land a Saturn V. I'll put it that way. It's a big area, and it might extend underneath where we could set up pressurized bases, the whole thing. Uh, can I ask uh, for, I just noticed, if we get the lights in the front here down? Shut them down, please. I just realized uh, that uh, I'm losing my contrast over here. That's it. Can't do any others? Can't no, we these? need those on, otherwise we don't see you. Oh. It's, uh, that, that already killed half your visibility there on yeah, YouTube. Well. Uh, all right, well, next time around, I'll just have to do what they do at Stealthane and bring the brightness up about 30%. But at least that was enough so you could start seeing some of these rills through here. That's not too bad. Okay, but meanwhile, elsewhere on the moon, sometimes you'll get lava formed from a major impact. This is the Copernicus crater. This is the one I was telling you that was 900 million years ago. It was huge when it was formed. This seems to have a 200-foot ramp leading right up to it. And this is an artist's conception. Uh, they're about to go into the, uh, into the cave, whatever is hidden in there and such. I like to think that I'm over here looking with the binoculars saying, you got to be kidding, you want to go in there? But you never know. And this might be just part of a network underneath this crater. And I'm just going to go real fast to this. Uh, the ages of lunar events, uh, the names that refer to over here, like Nectarian, there is a Mara Nectaris, uh, about four, roughly 4.3 billion years ago, the original crust came from the magma ocean. Between 3.9 and 4.3 billion years ago, you had most of the mare that we see today. Uh, and also flows of something called creep. This is potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus, materials that normally do not form together. And there was some kind of mixing that occurred. That's another reason why we have to go back to the moon, too, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The Imbrian effect one of the best parts of the moon to study is about nine or ten days after a given new moon. That's Mara Imbrium. It formed between 3.85 and 3.1 billion years ago. It and another object called Mara Oriental, which is right on the edge, always it's always tantalizing. You know all these great things to see, right on the edge of the moon. Eras Eratosthenian, between three and one billion years ago, impact craters without really good rays, mainly since probably the surface of the moon was still relatively warm comparatively. The Copernican crater is less than a billion years old. That's very young in geologic terms. You have bright rayed craters. 
and an area called Oceanus Procolarum that kept on flooding at least 20 times or more. So, this is a new topo map. Actually, it's a little bit old today. That's from Clementine observing our satellite on orbit in the 1990s. And you're able to see from near side to far side the topo map. These are all lower. These are, most of these are impact basins, especially this one. This is on the far side. This is the South Pole uh, Aitken region, and it is the largest impact feature in the known solar system. From point to point over here is the better part of 450 miles, and the depth is about seven miles or more. We don't have an exact date on that, because, uh, probably no, not date, uh, actual dimensions because it's a relatively crude map. And then we can look in composition. This is where iron would be found. And uh, the redder it is, the more that you get. Notice that the lunar far side, yes, it's got some iron over here, but the vast majority of it, almost none. And we think there is a reason for this, why the lunar far side has lots and lots of craters and almost no mare basins. The theory now is, when the moon formed, and we'll show that in a few moments, when the moon formed, it was much, much closer to the Earth. And the Earth itself was mostly molten. So you have a huge heat source, which is blasting one side of the moon, vaporizing some of the rock and depositing it on the lunar far side, which covers up almost everything in the process. Neat theory. It seems to match at least the observations. Okay, so here's the origin of the moon. Uh, an object about as little as 50 million years after the formation of our Earth about the size of Mars, hit on an offset impact, came around and then hit a major impact in their, uh, what Monty Python would call, hit with head and return. And this is exactly what happened. The two cores of the two objects merged together, forming a very large, and almost abnormally large, iron core, heating the interior of, the plan of our planet. And the debris thrown out orbited around the moon forming a ring system. And at least one moon, probably two, and the reason we say two is it's another theory why the lunar far side has such a thick crust, 200 uh, miles thick on, on that side, on the near side by us, about 20 miles or so, because all this debris hit from the other impact. So it's a very violent time right after the creation of uh, the solar system. And I like the detail. This is uh, done by a space artist and, and a, also a planetary astronomer by the name of William Hartman. You notice the impact here. You see the shadow of the impact on the early Earth. Look how close that is. We figure that was about 10,000 miles away. Imagine standing somehow on the surface of a ravaged Earth in what geologists today call the Hadean period, which was something like Hades. No, almost no atmosphere all molten lava around you, maybe you find a halfway solid surface to hover over, and you look up at the moon, and the moon is not this little thing that you can, half a degree, that you can put your pinky up, pinky nail up, and hide, behind, hide it behind. Instead, it's about 20 degrees across. This is 15 degrees for all of us. Or the human body is about right, and it's uh, proportions for every, between people. Point to point is 15 degrees, so you have to add another thumb onto that. That's 20 degrees. That's how big the moon was, and maybe even larger. And what's most important about this, not just are we looking at this very large, fierce-looking object, it's all molten still, you also have tides of molten rock under your feet. So you're being carried as this is coming up. It's moving you up maybe, I think the estimates are as high as 250 feet or more. As it's going once around the Earth, I think it was like something on the order of about 12 hours. So in doing that, though, it's transferring energy from the Earth to the Moon. It is backing away until it's at its present position today. And our Earth's day went from 20 hours to 24 hours, or approximately 24 hours. In the process of melting in that impact, you had completely molten magma, which eventually cooled down. The lighter materials, the anorthosite, Feldspar floated to the top, which is why the lunar highlands, the brighter areas of the moon, are so bright, because it's all this white material. The olivine kind of sank down, and the heavy pyroxene went almost to the core. 
Now it says not molten over here, it's more plastic, so it's close to being melted. At least this is the current theory of how we have the moon's face. So here's a new picture of the moon from a number of studies. Uh, we do have moonquakes, and they're caused actually because, speaking of tides, when the moon hits peri uh, perigee or closest approach each month to the Earth, there's some kind of plasticky material here, partially melted, and you get what today on Earth would be about a Richter 2, 2.5, something like that. But we do note it. You can have large impacts that form uh, the form the mare that we're seeing here. There are no, almost no water at all in the rocks, although there are tantalizing signs in dark shaded craters in the lunar south pole for ice that did not vaporize. Kama would hit the moon, material would cool down, and would head for the nearest place where it could, where quote unquote, it would be able to form. And it turns out that the on the far side here, there's possible water ice, millions of tons of it. That's a good thing if you want to uh, start a colony, and also if you want to have rocket fuel. There are highland impact craters, about 3.9 billion years in age, and humans walk for the first time on the moon, Mari Tranquilitatis over here. This is about the picture we think we're seeing right now. Okay. Now, you may ask, okay, you know, NASA's got a, had a big budget, not anymore. Uh, the Russian Federation has a little bit more money than we do. The Chinese want to get up there. How do I get some of this action, a piece of the action here? Well, it's easy. Get to your telescopes. You check the calendar for the phases and use a free program on the web. It's up to version 6 now. Virtual Lunar Atlas to plan what you want to see. So this is what it would look like. This is an earlier version now, it turns out. Uh, but I have the date on here. I set this up a couple years ago for 2012. October 23rd at about 5:20 in the afternoon, actually in the early evening. The field of view in this case is just about the size of the moon. It tells you what features are up here to look at, various sections. When you close in, you can find out. For example, you have uh, uh, Ptolemaeus and Alphonsus and Isatial crater over here, and it gives you detail about it. It gives you all the information that an astronomer would want to know: the lunation, how far since the last. Uh, new moon was, its illumination percentage, the sun's inclination to the, its equator, vibration effects, all sorts of things. It gives you the rise and the set, where in the sky to look. And it also gives you this. This tells you what the vibration is, what part of the lunar quote-unquote far side is visible. In this case, it's Mara Australia, the southern sea. Now, some of the photographs I took my, with my own equipment, some with the uh, Photogra photographic equipment at Sperry Observatory in Cranford. This is just before first quarter. This is the Serpentine Ridge in Mara Serenitatis over here. This is the Serpentine Ridge. It apparently is a shrinkage mark from the Mare itself that filled, when it filled that large impact that created that basin. Apparently as it cooled, it left this. And if you notice, sharp eyed over here, you'll see that there's an interface between serenity and tranquility here. This, these are actually two lava flows. And there we are. It's a somewhat better photo. Magma flows over time. This is that first quarter moon. You can see that there must have been a basin here that filled up and then more lighter colored material filled over it. And this is a little close up of the same area. This is from Apollo 17. You can definitely see where that different magma had, had first come in and this overlaid it. And by the way, at the time this picture was taken, there were boot prints right over here being made. That's where Apollo 17 landed. To the south, a uh, nine-day-old moon, you see Shikar, Zushius Plain. This might be, have been a mare area, this flat area here, that with all the impacts and such, just got overlaid with craters. At least that's one of the theories. Also a nine-day-old moon. This is Mari Humora. This is a perfect example of an impact feature where you have an object maybe two or three times the size of Manhattan, if not bigger, crashing into it, ripping out material. Point to point over here is roughly about 300 miles. And then the Mari comes up and fills it up. And then later on, craters form over it, like Gassend excuse me, Gassendi crater. 
and Arzatiol, Alphonsus, and Ptolemaeus craters. These are more walled plains. They're large craters, but they're flat bottomed. And focusing on this guy over here, uh, we've, it's a shame we can't get it a little bit darker, but there are three patches of dark material here, and one here, and one here. In the late 18th century, William Herschel, the gentleman who discovered uh, the planet Uranus, considered to be the, fa the founder of modern observational astronomy, noted two or three red lights in the crater. Today we see what look for all the world as if they're volcanic cinder cones. He may have been watching a point volcanism at that time, a place where for a little while gas, hot gases escaped forming those glows. Now normally I would, I would have discounted it except that Herschel was an incredible observer and he did not allow himself to be fooled by uh, a problem with the atmosphere. Okay. Straight wall, which is really a neat object over here. Get this there we go, right through here. Rupes recta. It's a classic fault line. We think that those fault lines are created specifically by shrinkage underneath the moon. It is about 600 feet high and about 20 miles long. And it's easy to spot just past first quarter. And we look from Clavius Crater, another walled plain, but this is really cool because when we're doing geology over here on the moon, we're looking what came first, which crater came first. Of course, the big one and smaller ones, and even smaller as well. So we get a rough relative age dating, not just with Clavius Crater, but all the craters of the moon. All the way down, poor little Copernicus over here. And this is Copernicus Crater. Seven to ten day old moon is the best time to look for it. It's a young moon. It's a young object on the moon. It's 900 million years old. It's been around. And again, if you could take this crater and bring it to the Earth, it would go from here to here 60 miles. And by the way, had the Apollo program not been cut off at Apollo 17, had it gone to Apollo 20, one of the ideas was to land within the crater walls here with Apollo 20. That would have been wild. Um, yeah. How did they get the uh, age? Uh, the age, again, it's a relative thing, but most importantly, okay. if I remember correctly, Apollo 14 took some material on the landing site where they went to, to Framaro, there was some material that was thrown out from Copernicus Crater, and they were able to get a, a good guesstimate. A lot of these things are guesstimates, unfortunately, because we just frankly went to six places on the moon, and that's it. So you can't, you know, you, you need to get boots on the ground elsewhere. It's one of the big reasons why we have to go back. Uh, in the case, uh, matter of fact, uh, Copernicus Crater is down here. This is Mara Imbrium I had mentioned before. These little mountains that you're seeing over here are actually the tips of the iceberg, if you will. When the crater formed, it fractured the land, threw it up. Then it got filled in by lava from beneath, from magma from beneath, and only the tops of these now show. And then later on we had other craters like Plato over here, or Archimedes Crater. And the Apennine Mountains are just the top, again, the top of a much larger crater buried under maybe as much as maybe, I'd say about three miles or more of magma. This is really an amazing area to look to. You can spend hours just pulling out details all through here. This is pretty cool over here, too. This is Alpine Valley. And at one time, it was thought to be what we call a, um, a graben. Basically, you have two fault lines, and they pull apart, and the block that's in the middle poof, drops down. But it turns out, apparently, that's not quite right. Because very good telescopes, not in this photograph, but very good telescopes and good seeing show a rill, what's left of a lava tube. So apparently there was a lava flow, maybe that formed Atomara Imbrium, then the magma pulled back, and then uh, maybe in the formation one of the other nearby craters formed that rill. This is a great place to view. Okay, and the Aristarchos and Maria, Marius Hills area. Uh, 11 day to 24 day old moon. This is the youngest crater on the moon. So, but we believe it's about somewhere in the order of about 200 million years, maybe a little less than that. Which basically means that it's a possibility that the trilobites may have been looking at a shallow seas and may have seen the impact forming this crater. Mm -hmm. This is also an area that we also see something called uh, transient lunar phenomena. Basically, 
you're looking at glows, discolorations, sometimes an honest to God red glow when the shadow hasn't quite reached the crater. There is a rill over here called Schroeder's Valley, which extends from the crater, just below the crater Herodotus over here. This whole region, when you look at it through a telescope, doesn't show well on here, is about a mile higher than the surrounding mare through here. You see there's Copernicus, there's Kepler Crater, and you see the rays. The, by the way, the brighter the rays on the, of an object on the moon, the younger it is. See, that's another part of that relative age thing. But this over here, this is kind of a puzzle. This is a very young crater. It doesn't have the ray system that we're seeing here. Instead, it has like a tail coming off to one side. So we have a bit of a mystery there. A uh, slightly better view. Um, don't believe the Apollo 15 shot here. I took this with my brownie a couple weeks ago. Uh, but there is Aristarchos Crater. You can see some of that thrown out material. By the way, it's for scale. This is roughly 25 miles. Herodotus is much older. And this, again, is one of these great mysteries. There's Schroeder's Valley. We have never gotten a clear photo in here. It's permanently shade, uh, shaded. There may be a huge cavern going under here. Maybe. Very difficult to see. This was taken with our 24-inch telescope down at Sperry Observatory some years ago. This is Mar Oriental. This is the, it's the east, it's funny, it's named the Eastern Sea, but when they changed the nomenclature, uh, it became, it ended up on the western side of the moon, go figure. But this is a large circular basin, and it kicked up some mountains and formed other areas like the Cordillera Mountains and the Rook Mountains here. It's not easy to see, and sometimes you have to wait as long as three or four years to be able to check it out, to be able to see. And I think the next time around, you know, say it's for 24, this is 2014, I think 2016 is the next time it'll be well positioned from Earth. And then we have uh, rills that are cut through here of uh, Mare Vaporum. Six to nine day, a day old moon. Again, this is all debris that came out of the formation of the Imbrian Basin all through here. And there is a catena. There are several, but this is the most prominent. This is called Davy. Uh, just past first or last quarter phase. And you can see, we, the theory is that there was a comet that came too close to the moon, and its fragments went bang, 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 bang. A chain of craters, hence the term catena. This is a composite. Now, a lot of what you saw before this shot would ta was taken with ordinary film. Everybody remember film? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of a legend about it? Well, most of that was done. This was taken by one of my students. Uh, I teach a QL course, which is similar to what we have up here uh, at NJA uh, at Sperry Observatory. And uh, that, the night I was training my uh, observers to become senior observers, trained on the 10-inch refractor, uh, the guy had just bought a brand new Nikon uh, digital uh, single lens reflex. And I said, okay, well, let's see what we can get with this. He takes two photos, and we stitch it together to form this beautiful rain region from uh, Rainbow Bay up here, Sinus Iridium, through Copernicus, all the way down through here, down to Tycho. In two photos, he blew me out of the water. <laughs> I've been doing this, at that time I was uh, doing astrophotography, particularly with the moon and the planets, for the better part of maybe about 22 years, and uh, two shots, boom, you know. <laughs> It goes to show you the power of a digital camera. What a beautiful shot. This is just a beginner's luck. And it worked out nice. He's taken much better shots since. So this is what you can do. It's a composite of the 10-day-old moon. Now, looking to the future a bit. Uh, I'm going to be very optimistic and say that uh, once, well, I don't like getting political, but we have a president, unfortunately, that does not have the vision that is necessary for space exploration or a lot of other things, but particularly with space exploration. The NASA budget is pared down to bare bones. Most of what you'll be reading about in the next two or three years will be from robotic probes. I don't knock them. I mean, uh, if, if people invite, if I'm invited back, I could talk about InSight, which will go to the surface of Mars and put a probe 10 feet underground more or more to be able to see the look at the interior of Mars and understand the geophysics of the planet. Uh, there is Osiris, uh, Osiris Rex, which is going to go to an asteroid called 101955 Bennu. 
In 2016, it'll be launched. 2019, theoretically, it'll approach it and take a sample. As little as two and a half ounces, as much as four pounds. And then in 2023, it'll swing by, the spacecraft will swing by Earth and drop off the package. And we'll finally get pristine material from this object that, um, how many people here expect to live to the year 2166? Me, okay, me too, a couple of us, a couple guys over there, okay, great. Uh, good, we'll, we'll all be able to see this. Between 2166 and 2199, there are eight opportunities for Bennu to crash into the Earth. Right now, it's only about a 7% chance. 7% it makes me lose sleep at night. It's an Earth-crossing asteroid. The reason it's been selected to have OSIRIS-REx go to it is because it's so easy to get to. The delta V, the change of speed and direction, is very low. That also means it ain't too much that it could change course and hit the Earth, okay? So the more time we have to explore it, the better. But that's for a lecture in the future. We'll talk about that later. But unfortunately, we get back to this. We're not going back to the moon in any time rather soon. I would like to think maybe by, please God, by 2025, maybe we'll finally get back up there with some vehicle, Orion, maybe a commercial vehicle, I hope, landing on the moon and setting up the beginnings of full-scale exploration of small lunar base to the sun. And here's why we need to go back, really. Incomplete sampling and in a biased mineral region. I don't have the slide for that, unfortunately, but there, the mapping of the moon compositional-wise. Remember I mentioned something called creep earlier? the potassium and the rare earth element and phosphorus minerals. Those are contaminants that unfortunately of the six landings, four of those six landed right in the middle of the stuff. So that is a biased sample. Only Apollos 11 and 17 didn't have that, that statistically skewed area. We need to go back and sample more areas further away. It's a great place. The moon is a great platform for observa astronomical observation. For 14 nights, 14 days Earth time, you have no sun. It is dark. Yeah, it's cold. But you can do observations without worrying about clouds coming in or particularly having an atmosphere which stops ultraviolet light. Tentatively, they took an instrument called the Carruthers Camera, named for a gentleman that noted this and said, it'd be great, you're on the moon, let's take some photographs in the ultraviolet. First photographs, first astronomical observations were done from there with that camera. Imagine being able to go instead of maybe 20, 30, 40 seconds, how about two or three hours? Practice for future exploration, for example, the asteroids and Mars. If you can make it on the moon, it's like New York. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. Well, if you can survive and thrive on the moon, the asteroids, particularly Mars, because Mars does have a thin atmosphere, you'd be able to practice for it and get ready for it. And most importantly of all, expansion of the human species beyond Earth. If something happened here, an asteroidal impact, we just decide we're going to throw nukes at each other. Some horrible biological, uh, either weaponized material or something mutates out of, say, a bowl or something, it goes airborne and has a tendency to wipe out 90% of Earth, Earth's humans or more. Getting humans off Earth and onto the moon and eventually to Mars means we don't have our, our uh, genetic eggs in all in one basket. Survival. So here we are setting up shop, and there's the Earth from the background, of course, a lane vehicle coming down, bringing more materials for the habitats here. There are solar panels to the bottom. And maybe a permanent human presence, as you're seeing here. And again, I'm being very optimistic. I'm, I'm giving a date on this by 2045. And a practice site for Mars. Again, a Mars vehicle, you're able to simulate a lot of things when you have a vacuum around you. Uh, with a little bit of luck, maybe we'll get to Mars, maybe before, I'm hoping before 2045. I mean, I'm not getting any younger, I'm sorry. So, when it comes to going to the moon or even studying astronomy in general, understanding is a kind of ecstasy by Carl Sagan, who was pretty ecstatic about going to the moon and to Mars, and eventually beyond that. And yes, this is, for those that probably recognize it, this is Earthrise. One of the most iconic photographs that has ever been taken of the Earth from orbit around the moon. However, you notice it's turned. I don't have it with a horizontal horizon and the moon rising. There's a reason for it. 
This is how Ed Anders saw it from Apollo 8. This is how an explorer sees the Earth as it's rising, as you're coming around the moon and watching the big blue marble appear from behind the limb of the moon. This is how the explorers see it. This is how I like to see it. So you're all on an assignment tonight. If you've got this picture on your wall, you are to take that picture and turn it so it matches this. Okay, everybody got that? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be checking, I have cameras everywhere. So this is how explorers will see it, hopefully later on in the 21st century. And I have to thank my wife, Bonnie, for making sure everything stays straight. Kim and Elvira over here were the ones that had the brand new digital camera. And I'm glad that they got some good pictures, actually. Gene Shoemaker, who started a lot of the science here. Ralph Baldwin, who got it right. Paul Spudis who wrote some, and Chuck Wood that have written some terrific books in a, uh, on the moon and how to observe it. And, of course, the crews of Apollo 7 through 17. We owe them a, a heck of a, uh, a great debt just getting us started. And by the way, I'm not totally down on the idea that it's going to take years to get out there. After all, uh, the, dis the time between uh, Columbus and Cortez was about 40, 45 years. So we're coming up on that 45 years now. And I like to think that maybe we'll repeat, history repeat itself at this time in space, that we'll get back out there. Okay, and that's that. And I thank you for your attention. Now, um, I'm going to make some recommendations. We can get the, ah, there we go. Thank you for the lights. Read my mind. If you want to learn more about the moon in general and how we got there and stuff, I have some recommendations of books over here. Um, the one that really got me started going, going back to the moon observing was this one. It's by Paul Spood. It's called The Once and Future Moon. It was put out by Smithsonian Books and it's still available. It is a good overview of how we know what we know. And, and on top of that, yeah, I keep forgetting about the camera up there. And like I said, I have, I have cameras in all your houses as well. He has a camera on me. Uh, this is a knockout book. I recommend it. And uh, he, he pulls no punches as to uh, the scientific information, how and why we have to get back there. His friend, uh, the modern uh, Charles Woods, would uh, create, put this book together a couple years ago called The Modern Moon, and it covers every section of the moon. Each of the numbers here corresponds to a chapter in here. Uh, if you, oh yeah, I'll hold this for just a moment. And then, if you want to find out how we got to the moon and what we did there, this came out just, uh, this is on the 40th anniversary, I think the 45th is about to come out, from Springer. Uh, Hartland's Exploring the Moon, the Apollo Expeditions. This is a knockout. When I, a lot of the information that's on here came from here. And understand, it helped me understand why the geologists told them to go to a particular area or not. It also said some of the problems they had, too. <laughs> but Now, if you want to observe the surface for yourself, uh, Antonin Ruchel this is, had written this and, drew, and actually drew this. He's a lunar cartographer, The Atlas of the Moon. This originally was published some years ago by Astronomy Magazine. If you go on uh, any book search and try to find the original Astronomy Magazine publication, pr be prepared to drop three to five hundred dollars. It is that much of a classic. This only costs about thirty-two nowadays. It's put out by Sky Publishing. Same guys that bring you Sky and Telescope. And they did some improvements. They changed the color from kind of a pale green to a kind of a light blue, which under a red light, when you're observing, goes black and white. And then on the other side here, tells you what you're looking at. More detail about each crater or such. And this is a knockout book. As a matter of fact, you can get the, you know, understand something, folks. I am not a agent for Sky Publishing, okay? Uh, I have nothing to do with uh, Sky and Telescope. But you can get these in a two-book set with a slipcover. And uh, it looks really pretty in the, on the, in the library. It looks even better at the eyepiece of the telescope. And if you want to have a challenge, you can get this. This is old, relatively old, because the lamination is really nice. Today it's some kind of a plastic embedded paper. But this is the Lunar 100 card. Various features that are marked off from 1 to 100. And he has the full master list in the back. Uh, let's see something here. How many people, <clears throat> excuse me, how many people have seen the moon? 
Okay, don't be shy. Everybody's seen it. Good, you got number one already. And if you look at a very thin crescent right a couple days after uh, new moon, you will see what's called the old moon and the new moon's arms, also known as earth shine. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. If you have, you got number two already. The most difficult stuff down here, the, the last 10 I'm still working on, <laughs> including the last one, Mara Marginis uh, swirls, magnetic deposits, it's number 100. You gotta wait till the moon is just at the right angle to our view. I've never seen it myself. Uh, sometimes I wonder if you're gonna need a Apollo craft to go out there to be able to view it. So, now, something else too. My exploration on the on the internet uh, for our, our observer's handbook in the other uh, club. I put together these photo maps of the moon. Uh, I've got a limited number of these, but if anybody wants them, okay, let's get this right. I had this set up so that one side over here is how it looks through a telescope, and the other side through a telescope with all the features delineated. And I have a limited number of these. I can give a set to, I think, up to 10 people right now. So 10 lucky, lucky people will be able to get it. And I even have, today when we went to Walmart just before here, I got uh, some of these mail envelopes that we could put it in. So you can come up in a minute or two. And there's a reason for you to come up more than just the photo maps of the moon. Uh, in the words of the immortal uh, Curly Howard, gee, I could hardly wait. Here are three lunar meteorites. Chips off the moon. I have a magnifier I'll pull out. And just for the heck of it, I needed something to hold this, you know, keep it from jumping around too much while it was being transported. So I have a piece of an asteroid. This is for, from Fort Vesta. It fell in a place called Camel, Camel Watering Hole, Camel Ganga, uh, Australia, back in 19, back in, I keep forgetting about that camera, uh, back in uh, 1989, if I remember correctly. And this is close to as many people will probably get, except for our young people here, uh, to the moon and particularly to Fort Vesta, which was just recently visited, of course, by uh, the Dawn spacecraft. So after viewing Dawn, we know this definitely, and others like it, definitely came from Fort Vesta. So you, this is about as close as some people will get to. You're welcome to come up and take a look. Uh, I'm afraid there are no free samples. Uh, if you want to get meteorites, however, for yourself, uh, I brought up some for, uh, for sale up here. They're relatively cheap. You know, it's a double pun, as I've said before. It's like a rock group of uh, uh, cheap meteorites. Uh, ouch. Uh, but you can take home a piece of the early solar system if you want. And uh, I'm, uh, Jim, I'm just letting you know that I'm not, uh, not charging for these things anyway. This is a straight donation. So whatever with that price that, that goes right into the treasury here to support the programs here. Please buy meteorites tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So let me set this up. Now, before I, as I'm doing this, are there any questions? I've stunned everyone. Oh my God. Ah, there's one in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned before uh, the, the mining of uh, titanium. Yeah. What not there? Just the logistics and economics of that uh, to bring that back. I mean, yeah, well, is titanium really that? Is it? Titanium is valuable. Is considered to be a wonder metal. If you could build a, again, you build a, a car out of it, you wouldn't have to about worry about rusting. The SR-71 Blackbird and many other uh, vehicles that go at a hypersonic speed can do that because titanium has a very high melting point. That's why you need solar energy to be able to get it out. It's a difficult metal to work with in general here on Earth. If you're in a vacuum, however, you don't have to worry about, say, air pockets and the materials are melting it. Getting it back to Earth might be might be problematic, but give it to an engineer, it's all numbers. They'll figure it out. So after all, the, originally they thought that uh, bauxite, aluminum, was impossible to get out in any large quantity. And then a chemist said, oh, well, we could throw a, if we throw electricity through it under the right conditions, uh, the molten ore, it'll come right out. Now, aluminum is one of the cheapest metals. So just a matter of engineering and the, and the desire to solve the problem. What about the mining of H3? Oh, oh. helium-3? Oh, that's easy. Uh, tell you what, excuse me one second. I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt you. We have a break in the sky. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, 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 I want Al to answer your question. So I'll just answer okay. it on the side, if you would. Okay. Me too. Uh, Jim, did you want to do a Going we, we real fast, then, 
Helium-3 is a fusion fuel. We're trying desperately to come up with a, a nuclear system where you have almost no waste at all and lots of energy. The power of the sun brought down to Earth in the service of humanity. Helium-3 is easy to fuse together. It produces very little radioactive waste. You get a helium-4, basically what you put in a balloon. And the energy yielded is uh, a nuclear reactor, a standard fission reactor with uranium and such, is only about 2 or 3% efficiency. This is up to 12% or more. And the ocean has a lot of hydrogen in it, but the moon is laced with helium-3, deposited there by the sun. And that's easy to extract. You just heat the soil up and stuff's driven out. You just condense it out and ship it back to Earth and charge 40,000 bucks a pound. And you'll get your money back real fast. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we, if we have a break in the clouds, we've got to get these people well. upstairs. Thank you. Thank you for your joke, please. It's my privilege to be the president of the New Jersey Astronomical Association, and we're hosting uh, very, very educational speakers like Al, John, our program director, and all the people that make this work. There's over, over a staff of 75 people that donate their time to make this work all year. We need your support. There's a donation station in the back. Please, if you would, consider helping us by either buying media rights or making a deposit in the donation box. Thank you very much. And please, little opportunity to go see this guy's see Paul and you're good to go. No, no. All right, we will just give you a quick update as quick as it opened to close on us already. But, no. uh, that, but, but we're here for another hour. We're until 10.30. So uh, there's plenty of things to do. Mr. the bathrooms. Uh, <laughs> we, we've got the uh, uh, store in the back. And please, I didn't. I really felt bad cutting Al off, but if you have any more questions for him, he's still here, well, and he'd love to answer you questions. Have to, you have to understand something, that this is the second time that an astronomical event has interrupted me. The first time was, uh, what was that, Bon, uh, back in, May, in March? March. We had Comet Pan Stars through a hole in the clouds, and I'm about to start my lecture. The more